business. Um, we have to get a hold of our society. We have an important election coming up um, next week, the primary, and then a national election in November. And there's actually some little mechanisms of power that we need to get our hands on and take advantage of. And that's some of what we're going to be dealing with today. My name is Chris Weidenbach, C-Dub. I teach in the English department here at Laney. Um, I'm in my 20th year as a proud Laney Eagle. Wow. Um, and I've been working with an awesome group of people um, who you're going to meet, you'll, you'll meet a couple of them very soon. Um, but for the last several years, we've been hosting these events um, called Teach Ins. And we can do whatever we want with them. And we're trying to do, like I said, we're trying to do the people's business. We're trying to take on uh, ideas, introduce people to movements, and connect people with opportunities to empower ourselves and have more say in how our society runs. I forgot, I, I forgot I was supposed to say it. I'm Chris, and... I'm Maria. <laughs> Welcome. I'm a student leader um, and also a a member of the Poor People's Campaign, uh, Lady Chapter Poor People's Campaign. Uh, welcome. Uh, before we move on, I would just like to make some announcements, some housekeeping announcements. Uh, we have the uh, public convenience uh, on the level two as well as level one on the ground floor. Uh, in case of an emergency, we have exits uh, at the top uh, on the sides and uh, there's another exit there. We will not panic, we will not rush in case of an emergency. Um, yes, and uh, be mindful, there will be a class that will use the forum uh, building straight after the teaching. So uh, can we please uh, leave the place better than how we found it? Thank you. This might seem preliminary. I think it's really important. Uh, when our group first started meeting, we put together uh, some language to explain, to understand for ourselves and for other people to understand, like what is, what's a teacher and uh, what, what are the kind of subjects that we're dealing with. And we'd like to share that with you just to be perfectly clear. Thank you. Um, the mission statement, Lady College Teaching Planning Committee mission and vision, September 2016. Our mission is to create public space to envision an equitable, abundant, sustainable future for our communities and our college. The vision that guides our mission is of a sustainable society and world of abundance, peace, and equality. That world is attainable. To that end, we will host public events to share vital information among the college and the community about socio-political issues in ways that are collaborative, educational, and informative. We will bring attention to increasing calls for austerity in the face of grow, growing wealth and exposing the national-wide links between toxic neglect in Oakland and everywhere else, as we did with the flint teaching about poisoning of water for over 100,000 human beings. We intend to focus on the crisis in our community and strategies for achieving a sustainable economic democracy for, that works for everyone. In the principles list, we're gonna uh, get a little bit interactive. Maria is going to be like a talk show host who's going out and mingling in the audience. And we'll, we'll just alternate. Uh, I'm gonna start with the top principle. Number one, we are rooted in a moral analysis based on our deepest religious and constitutional values that demand justice for all. And I'm sorry, I need to be clear. If you're not familiar with the Poor People's Campaign um, subtitle, a national, uh, a national Call for Moral Revival, um, 
It involves religious communities, non-religious communities, so-called conservatives, so-called liberals, all kinds of different people. And they've been very effective uh, starting out in North Carolina with the Moral Mondays movement, bringing people together who don't always rock together and getting some work done that's just common sense, good government, good society strengthening action. Um, so, the Poor People's Campaign Principles. Uh, we are rooted in a moral analysis based on our deepest religious and constitutional values that demand justice for all. Moral revival is necessary to save the heart and soul of our democracy. We are committed to lifting up and deepening the leadership of those most affected by the systematic racism, poverty, the war economy, the ecological devastation to the building and unity across lines of division. Three, we believe in the dismantling of unjust criminalization systems that exploit poor communities and communities of color and the transformation of the war economy into a peace economy that values all humanity. Number four, we believe that equal protection under the law is non-negotiable. Number five, we believe that people should not live in or die from poverty in the richest nation ever to exist. Blaming the poor Claiming that the United States does not have an abundance of resources to overcome poverty are false narratives used to perpetuate economic exploitation, exclusion, and deep inequality. We recognize the certain, certainty, excuse me, I have to come right now. So what do you think, number six? We recognize the centrality of systemic racism in maintaining economic oppression must be named, detailed and exposed, empirically, morally, and spiritually. Poverty and economic inequality cannot be understood apart from a society built on white supremacy. Seventh, we aim to shift the distorted moral narrative often promoted by religious extremists in the nation from issues like prayer in school, abortion, and gun rights to one that is concerned with how our society treats the poor, those on the margins, the least of these, women, LGBTQIA folks, workers, immigrants, the disabled, and the sick, equality and representation under the law, and the desire for peace, love, and harmony within and among nations. Number eight, we will build up a power of people and state-based movements to serve as a vehicle for a powerful moral movement in the country and to transform the political, economic, and moral structures of our society. Uh, nine. Would someone, someone volunteer to take number ten? I'm looking for you. Nine. We recognize the need to organize at the state and local level. Many of the most regressive pol policies are being passed at the state level, and these policies will have long and lasting effect, past even executive orders. The movement is not from above, but below. We will do our work in a non-partisan way. No elected officials or candidates get the stage or serve on the state organizing committee of the campaign. This is not about left and right, Democrat or Republican, but about right and wrong. 11, we uphold the need to do a season of sustained moral direct action as a way to break through the tweets and shift the moral narrative. We are demonstrating the power of people coming together across issues and geography and putting our bodies on the line to the issues that are affecting us all. Our last principle, the campaign and all its participants and endorsers embrace nonviolence, 
violent tactics or actions will not be tolerated. All right, so um, I hope some of that is, uh, uh, you know, idea territory that you can see some wisdom in already. Uh, Poor People's Campaign has a, they have a presence on the website. They're easy to find. Just search for Poor People's Campaign. Uh, the more you see, the more you see what they're up to. I think uh, you, you'll also start to recognize uh, people like uh, Reverend Barber and other leaders in the Poor People's Campaign. They're actually they're out and about, and they're making the news, and they're making things happen. Okay, we will move on with the program. Uh, I will introduce our first guest speaker uh, for the morning for the program. Um, she has nearly 50 years in jobs as varied as grassroots community organizer, social issues advocate, political campaign strategist, and non-profit director. She uh, has pushed, poked, prodded, and worked co cooperatively with the political, economic, and civic establishments on mission to increase social and economic justice. She has often uh, that has met working with labor, poor, the marginalized people, and community groups to create opportunities for the constructive social change where none seem to exist. And lastly, that has meant maintaining a keen understanding of current public policy and politics, working effectively with all levels of government agencies, the private business, generating media interest, and working cooperatively cooperatively and effectively with all kinds of people across racial and class lines. And always that has meant being a talent builder and a visionary and strategist. She understands that the key to our present unprecedented lack of good jobs and our exploding chasm between wealth and poverty is the transformation of the industry economy by labor replacing, computer-controlled electronic production. We, we need a new sustainable economy, she says, aiming at providing economy, economic security, security and justice. Please put your hands together and welcome Mrs. Ethel Longstock. All right, so um, I want to recognize some of the family that's here. Um, Laney College, can you show a little love if you're in this audience? Are you here? Come on now. This ain't cricket. Come on now. All right, now I've heard tell that there might be some guests like Berkeley Community College might be up in here. Come on now. Show us a little love. All right. I've also heard that there might be Sacramento um, Poor People's Campaign that is representing right here. Is that Miss Bobby? All right, all right, thank you. Also, I don't know, but I saw I may be a few of some of the warriors from San Jose for housing rights. Is anybody here from uh, San Jose and housing rights? All right, yeah, the brothers have been doing that for a while. Now, that, I don't want that to eat into my five minutes, Miss Hickey. Uh, that was me just doing some recognition of our folk. And then we got our own Michelle Snyder. Uh, who is a uh, reporter extraordinaire, along with Mr. Austin Longscott, ex uh, reporter extraordinaires. And they're also helping us. There's a documentation that's being done of this particular teach-in uh, because we are really honored to have as our guests um, Moms for Housing. Let's do a little shout out because it's some of our leading warriors in our city, as well as uh, soldiers on the front for public education, and, and our MCs will cover that. So my job today is to talk for a moment about this is a Black History Month program. We are reminded that we are in in-stage capitalism. And because of that, we've got to vote like our lives depend on it. You're going to hear me say that again, but I think it keep it there now. Black slave labor was the foundation of American capitalism. Slavery made the country rich and capitalism made sure most workers were poor. Despite the cosmetic changes since slavery, capitalism is dying because human labor is being replaced with more productive automation. This promises more and more cheaper goods and services 
but we human beings who are lo no longer needed are being thrown away. As the billionaire class and, and uh, accumulates more wealth, more working people fall into insecurity, poverty, and homelessness. Whole communities are decimated, and we can sure attest to that in this city of Oakland. Young people graduate from school, thousands of dollars in debt, and we're lucky to find a minimum job even after all of that. People are fed up, but they are, when they take a stand, they're confronted with police uh, violence. In this election uh, season, we the people are debating the role of government. Is government's main job to see that all of the people thrive or just the rich and powerful? We have entered a vast economic and social revolution that could end with the reconstruction of society on the basis of cooperation rather than exploitation. This would forever put an end to racism in all its forms, and yes, I said that. With so many struggling to survive, the question of government's responsibility for the people's well-being is on the national agenda. The refusal of government to do anything but, take, but make the richest people even more rich and causing many, it's causing many questions by our, our neighbors and our family and ourselves is the, that the loyalty continues to be to callous corporate government that cares nothing for the lives of our people. The candidates are appealing to the people in the various ways, trying to convince them that they have a remedy for the country's worsening problems. And you know what, my friends? The word of socialism is now being spoken. Woo! And its merits being debated. Um, let's just be clear. It's an opportunity to consider. Socialism starts the transition to a whole new cooperative society. All that stands is the, in the way is corporate, private ownership of the productive forces by a small ruling clique in its stranglehold on political power. About 40% of us in this country is feeling that right about now. And put your hand up if you might be in there. All right, so I know, all right. So this, in our teach-ins, we try to get to um, how to show the students you can fight for your basic needs housing, education, health, clean water, safety, security, by using the political process, including the electoral process, to get what we need. We are also teaching in, uh, in whose interests the current system is structured and who are they serving. We are promoting a critical consciousness about changes needed to reach full democracy, equality, and a society where basic human needs are met. The goal is to motivate you students who are overwhelmingly working class, oftentimes poor, to fight politically in, you, in your own interests and your community's interests. So now what do you need to know to do that? Well, one, the automation and the digital technology that is replacing workers is actually creating a new class. So they try to make us seem like we're small and each group is segregated by themselves. You're a migrant, you're a mom with kids, you're struggling. We ain't nobody because we're separate. But we are part of millions and millions that are across this, billions across this planet. Uh, so we're part of a new class. Uh, the corporate millionaires and billionaires who control society are destroying the social safety net and democracy that we might use in order to advance our cause. We have to stop that. This is where becoming political and voting comes in. I titled this, Vote As If Your Life Depends On It, because with all of our various unmet needs, it, it, it really does. Some candidates are appealing to the most historically backward and hateful uh, beliefs in our culture, beliefs that divide people and they prevent class unity, such as attack on women and our whole body anatomy, other attacks on immigrants, Muslims, people who are LGBTQ, our young people, and of course there's blatant racism that they whip up to win over a section of people who are angry at the destruction of their lives as they should be, but they are confused, misdirected, and sometimes they're lethal in fighting the wrong people. The poor are described as the criminals, lazy and uh, unworthy of help. The Poor People's Campaign teaches that we have to use, understand what are these platforms 
What are the programs of these various candidates that are running for office? We can understand this thing. We try to figure out how do we use our collective energy and education to break this thing down. It's important to challenge that the system of capitalism, as we're looking at this, who's for the people and who is, in fact, supporting corporations. I got you on that. Uh, but the two major political parties are busy trying to promote the status quo. They are trying to promote the, the, that, that the question of the extent, uh, uh, extending private property, that it'll, be, that it'll be here forever. That's a lie. It's already being destroyed. Capitalism is turning and eating itself in stage capitalism. We are living now in a, in a, we are living in a new era. Digital automated production of what, need, uh, of, of what we need has created and can create tremendous abundance on the one hand. But on the other hand, hunger, misery can also be created. But under capitalism, an obscenely wealthy class owns the machines that are developing this abundance. They own them privately and that needs to stop. They are impoverishing workers all over the world, and that needs to stop. As I br bring my comments to conclusion, there is no representative of the capitalist system that can provide those things under the laws of private ownership. We will either organize to gain the political power we need to create economic and political systems compatible with the new forms of laborless robot production, one in which goods are produced and distributed according to need, or the ruling class will impose hunger, homelessness, slavery, and indeed war. The world's people want a future of plenty, peace, safety, and security for our people. Workers must take this vision to those who are seeking answers and those who want our vote. At the end of the day, sisters and brothers, the future's up to us. Thank you. All right, all right. That's what's got me in the mood. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm going to introduce one of my colleagues on the faculty here at Laney, and uh, I feel sort of funny because I barely know her. But I also feel like I probably know her better than I think because uh, a lot of us realize that these these things these things that are going on in our in our bigger world in our real lives the things that impact our human needs and uh, our comfort, our level of self-respect, like everything. These should be part of our curriculum. This is, the, this is the real curriculum. This is lifelong learning. This is contextual analysis, critical thinking, right? So I'm an English teacher, but it's about society. The classes are about society, social organization and empowerment. Um, and I think I have a kindred spirit who I'm gonna introduce to you now. Um, at one of our political science faculty, um, and she's going to talk with you about small d democracy, how much democracy do we have, some stuff that's about like whether it's real or not, and how real we can make it. So please welcome a uh, political science faculty member from Laney College, Andrea Slater. All right, welcome everyone. Um, so, I am supposed to be talking about how campaigns and elections work in the United States and the full scope of 10 minutes. So this is normally <laughs> a couple hour lecture. So we'll, we will get through this and, uh, and allow hopefully a couple uh, minutes for questions. All right, so as was mentioned, we're all here because we have an election coming up. How many of you know that we have a primary election on March 3rd? How many of you have received your ballots? How many of you have already voted? Okay, good job. Good job. Okay, so I feel like I'm going to yell. <laughs> okay, all right. So, so when it comes to voting, we have eligibility requirements in the United States, and we some people feel like we don't have a full democracy because everyone is not allowed to vote. But why do we have voting restrictions, right? because we think that you need to have something vested in order to vote in an election in this country, and that's the way it's been set up from the beginning. So we've had a lot of changes over the past 200 years as far as what those restrictions are. So originally you had to be a white male property owner to vote in this country. We all know that or should know that by this point. Um, and so we've had some changes. So you're no longer required to have property, you're no longer required to be white or male. 
And so we've made some significant changes. We've had a lot of Voting Rights Acts that have been passed and laws that have been passed in order to influence these decisions. And that's been because of the work of the people. All right, okay, oops, sorry. So we have two sets of voters in this country. We have high propensity voters, or what we call likely voters, and we have low propensity or unlikely voters. Now, if you look at these characterizations, this is how we target who gets what in this country. And it's based on who is doing the voting. Let's just be frank, okay? So we, over recent years, have learned that most people, and I have to tell you, most of my work has been in political campaigns before I started teaching a couple of years ago. Um, we have what we call these high propensity voters that campaigns are going to go after, okay? They're going to go after these people because they know that they can count on them to get to the polls and they're gonna put that ballot in. I'm just looking in the crowd, it looks like 30% of you are planning to vote. I hope that's increased by the end of today. So we have people who are gonna vote no matter what the election is for, okay? We crack jokes, like if it's a vote for dog catcher, they're gonna make sure to get their ballot in, okay? So we've used this scale of eight out of 10. They voted in eight out of 10 of the last elections. So who does that exclude? Young New people. voters and young people, right? Because you don't have that track record. Most of you haven't even been eligible to vote for the last 10 elections, okay? Owning a home. So people who own homes are usually more invested because of things like property taxes, parcel taxes, and things like that that show up on our ballots. If you're married, you are supposed to be more likely to vote. Um, white with the college education used to be the standard bearer. That has since fallen off. And then this new voting block of black women over the age of 30 have been proven to be a significant voting block in this country and, and frankly saving a lot of these elections that could have gone the wrong way. You can clap. <laughs> You know, we, especially in the Southeast, we saw quite a few elections that might have gone in a way that was going to basically shut down women's rights in the South. Yes. And black women were the largest voting bloc to prevent those people from getting into off to office. So on the other side, the low propensity voters, usually people under 30. People under 30, usually still transitional. Moving around a lot, forget to turn in those registration forms. We had, um, I talked on voter suppression last week and I talked to five people who needed to re-register because they had moved. So if you move, changed your name, any of that, you need to re-register, okay? In order to stay on the rolls. Renters, right? Especially in this housing market, we move frequently. So making sure that you update your, re your registration is very key to making sure that you are able to exercise your right to vote. People of color, by and large, I teach poli sci one. Most of the people are taking it because they have to. Feel like politics does not impact them in any way, shape, or form. And I tell people, you may not do politics, but your landlord is, your banker is, okay? Politics is doing you, all right? So it's very important to be engaged. There is not an aspect of our society that does not have some type of political aspect to it down to school lunches, right? Everything is political. Single people, y'all are out living the life, not really caring about the future, <laughs> let's be frank. So single people are high on that low propensity voter list, okay? It's really hard to get people to remember to get to the polls. Um, and then low and moderate income. We have a number of people who are working multiple jobs. So even just trying to find the time to vote. And so the answer to that is we in California have vote by mail. You can sign up to be a permanent vote by mail voter. And that ballot will come to you in the mail, you fill it out, drop it right back in the mail. You don't even need a stamp in most counties, okay? I think today might be the deadline to request it. <laughs> so fortunately for Alameda County, we have a new vote center model that you're able to actually register on the same day, but your ballot will be what we call a provisional ballot until they verify that you are who you are. But either way, your provisional ballots in California do get counted. That is one of the things we do not have to worry about as in other states. Any other questions? Can you talk about no party preference voters? How do they get to vote in the primary? 
Okay, so we have a, a largely two-party system here in the United States and in California. And we have a lot of people who have elected to be declined to state your party preference. And so in order to vote in a Democratic, you cannot vote in a Republican primary right now if you are a declined to state or an independent voter, what's called an independent voter. Um, however, if you want to vote for a Democratic candidate, all you have to do is go to the polling place and request the ballot. The Democrat, the, the Democratic Party allows you to request the ballot. So you just need to ask for the ballot. So one of the things we want to talk about is voter suppression and disenfranchisement. So there are a number of tools that have been used legally in this country in order to suppress the vote. And suppressing the vote means preventing people from voting. So we have voter ID laws that are largely considered poll taxes and a number of states are being struck down. Um, but they are a way of keeping people away from the polls, gerrymandering, where we draw districts so that we know what the outcome is going to be ahead of time. And this can happen within a political party, it can happen across political parties. That's a way of keeping people from voting. Lack of language access. In California, I tell my students all the time, we're in a bubble here in California because we have so much language access. But in other states, they're still fighting over the Spanish being on ballots in some states. And that's ridiculous in this day and age. We have at least 14 languages that in any county that you can get your ballot in. So language access is an issue. Making sure that you understand what's on the ballot, if English is not your first language, is your right. Former felon disenfranchisement. There are states still that if you have a felony conviction, you are not allowed to vote. One of the biggest myths in California is that you are not allowed to vote if you have a felony conviction, but that is a myth. Yes. You are able to vote. You are able to register and vote just like anyone else. The only exceptions are if you are currently on parole, which they are working to change, working diligently to get changed, or if you have been found mentally incompetent. Okay? Other than that, you are, as long as you are over the age of 18, you are eligible to vote. Okay? And a citizen. Then we also have poll placements and limited days. So we have now interacted, gone back to having early vote, where you can vote up to 10 days before. Some, some areas it's actually 14. And so take advantage and not wait till the last minute. You don't have to worry about lines, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? So these are all ways that vote, votes are suppressed. We have worked really hard here in California to eliminate and alleviate some of these barriers. So honestly, you have no excuse. How many of you know that you can even take time off from work legally to go and vote? Yeah, you can ask for time off to vote. Okay? So I have been given the card. <laughs> My presentation today is based on an article in The Atlantic um, called The Billion Dollar Disinformation Campaign to Re-Elect the President by Mikhail Kopitz. Disinformation is more than lies. It is a deliberate attempt to make you believe false information, and it is, a, it is everywhere. It is spread especially easily and primarily through social media. Mikhail Kopitz, author, author of The Billion Dollar Campaign to Re-Elect the President, decided to investigate and make a blank Facebook account with a generic name. Once Copens had his account ready to go, he followed Donald Trump and anyone else recommended, like Ann Coulter and Fox Business, and many Trump fan pages. A multi-million dollar ad campaign during the impeachment inquiries aimed to mold the understanding of the American people. It painted Donald Trump as a hero, cracking down on foreign corruption, and the Democrats as plotting a coup. These false narratives were amplified by the right-wing websites, and soon McKay found himself questioning what had actually happened in reality. Sickly edited video clips published by the Trump campaign made it look like the impeachment testimony was an exoneration of guilt. This is a common strategy for liberal leaders around the globe. Instead of shutting down voices of dissent, they drown them out. This is called censorship through noise. After the 2016 presidential election, fake news was running rampant. Not only were places like Russia and Macedonia creating fake news and internet trolls, but the Trump campaign and his allies started to adopt the same information warfare tactics 
that have kept demagogues and strongmen in power. The gentle vocabulary used in the U.S. helps um, Oh, around disinformation, like alternative facts are muddying the waters, helps mask the seriousness of this threat to our democracy. There's a big focus in our news on the Kremlin and Russia's, dis Russia's disinformation campaigns against their own people. China's suppression of information, like Tiananmen Square, or the Philippines' strongman president's fear-mongering to justify shooting anyone in the street doing anything with drugs. All of this makes it easy to feel like disinformation is a far away and foreign problem but it is rampant in the US as well. Micro-targeting is a key tool in disinformation. Micro-targeting is when you target ads to only a specific niche of people. As McKay states, an ad that calls for defunding Planned Parenthood may receive a mi mixed response nationally, but target it to 800 Roman Catholic women in Dub Q, Iowa, and its reception will be much more positive. This is often used to perpetuate disinformation. In the 2016 presidential race, a few days before election day, Trump's team tried to, to suppress the black vote by running ads solely into African-American users' feeds that read, Hillary thinks African-Americans are super predators. This was a blatant attempt to keep African-American voters away from the polls. Micro-targeting is not only a Republican issue. Both parties will be using these types of ads in the 2020 presidential race, but Donald Trump has an advantage. The Republican National Convention has collected over 3,000 data points on every voter in the United States. This means Donald Trump can tweak and change his ads based not just on gender and geography, but on whether the recipient owns a gun or watches the Golf Channel. With over $1 billion set aside for ads for Donald Trump's 2020 re-election campaign, the disinformation campaigns have barely begun. From June to November of 2016, Donald Trump ran 5.9 million ads on Facebook, while Hillary Clinton ran only 66,000. A CBS and News YouGov poll has found that just 11% of strong Trump supporters trust mainstream media, while 91% turn to the president for accurate information. This dynamic makes it all but impossible for the press to hold the president accountable, something Trump himself seems to understand. Remember, he told a crowd in 2018, what you're hearing and what you're reading is not what's happening. Mm. Hundreds of innocuous sounding publications have popped up meant to look like local news sources. Readers are given no indication that these sites have political agendas, which is precisely what makes them valuable. According to one longtime strategist, candidates looking to plant a negative story about an opponent can pay to have their desired headlines posted on some of these news sites. By, not working, oh, by working through a third-party consulting firm and not paying the sites directly, candidates are able to obscure their involvement in the scheme when they file expenditures with the Federal Election Commission. Even if these stories don't fool savvy readers, the headlines are convincing enough to be flashed across the screen in a campaign commercial or slipped into fundraising emails. Disinformation is a tactic used on both sides of party lines, and it is one that will be rampant in the 2020 elections. It is more important than ever to get out there and vote. We need to use our voices to fight for freedom for the American people, and our generation must be the one to finally make a change. It's easy to feel like one vote doesn't matter, or like the entire system is rigged against us, but we are the only ones who can make a change for the better. Disinformation is used to suppress our votes and to control political dissent. The best and only way to combat this is with our own votes. It's interesting that when, when, when the people's candidates started winning elections, the rules start to get changed and a lot of other forms of manipulation are taking place. Um, we, can't let them, we can't let them win that way. We can, we can overwhelm them just by having a majority of votes. We just have to get excited and get everybody around us to, to care and get out there and flip our little levers of power and we can still win or we can win again. <laughs> um, one system of control has been in place for a very, very long time, you could say from the beginning. And uh, a Laney student who uh, I just met a couple weeks ago and she's been rocking with the Poor People's Campaign here at Laney is going to talk with you about that. Please welcome Jessica Shumway. Good 
Good morning, everyone. Thank you for attending today's teach-in at Laney College. My name is Jessica Shumway, and this is my first semester at Laney College. I will be doing a reflection on the article from The Atlantic called The Electoral College's Racist Origins, written by Wilfred Codrington III. He is a scholar at the Brennan Center for Justice at New York University School of Law. More than two centuries ago, after it was designed to empower Southern white voters, the system continues to do just that. It has been over two centuries since the framers put together the Electoral College to get a clear understanding of how the Electoral College works and what the purpose of the Electoral College is. We need to go back in time to the late 1700s and early 1800s. Around the late 1700s and early 1800s, our framers were debating among themselves how to elect the president and the vice president. The framers' first most and pressing fears were slavery and race. Now in the midst of their debates, the framers did have a bunch of ideas and methods to select the president chief executive. When the idea of a popular vote was brought up, the framers and other delegates griped openly and stating that it could result in way too much democracy. They were fearful that having a popular vote could result in a president having an overreach of his office. With few objections from the other delegates, they very quickly disregarded the notion that people could elect their leader. Delegates in the slaveholding South had an ulterior motive for opposing the direct election method, and they had no problem expressing and voicing their concerns. In the North, the population had the right to vote, was diversified, broad and open, versus the South. The populations in the South and North were approximately equal, but one third of those living in the South were held captive and in bondage. Due to the South's large non-voting slave population, the South would be at a huge disadvantage if the popular vote method was put into effect. Their ultimate solution was to use a method of indirectly electing the president, a method that would leverage the three-fifths compromise that they had set as the foundation for electing seats in Congress. The three-fifths compromise counted each enslaved African as three-fifths of a person for representation in Congress. This would increase the South's congressional delegation by 42% due to 93% of the slaves living in five southern states. When it came time to agree upon the system to choose the president, it was super easy for the delegates to turn to the three-fifths compromise as their foundation. From putting this system into effect, the Electoral College was born. Ironically enough, the Electoral College has resulted in numerous examples of racial entitlement when selecting the president. The first major failure of the Electoral College resulted in a tie between Thomas Jefferson and running mate Aaron Burr. A little less known historical event about the election of 1800 is the systematic operational embrace of the three-fifths compromise. Due to the South's advantage and their bonus electoral votes they received for maintaining slaves by not allowing them to vote made all the difference in the country regarding the election outcome. It provided slaveholder Thomas Jefferson an advantage over his opponent and currently in office president and abolitionist John Adams. Even now today, we, more than two centuries after the enactment of the Electoral College, we see it still designed to empower elite Southern whites. Currently, the system impacts black voters by diluting their political power. Due to the high concentration of black people residing in the South, their preferred candidate loses in their home state electoral votes. Disregardless of black voting patterns, five of the six states whose populations are 25% or more black have consistently been read in recent presidential elections. Three of those states haven't voted for a Democrat in more than four decades. To sum up, the Electoral College still to this day submerges black votes. It also hurts poor white voters who share and have similar interests to poor blacks. 
for example, votes for better health care, better public schools, and other public services that would benefit all poor people. It still is at its core what the Electoral College is and what ha has always been, a representation of the small elite few against the majority. Thank you, everyone, for your time. I'm Kimberly King. I am a psychology professor. I'm the coordinator of the Emoja program. I also work with my union, the Peralta Federation of Teachers. And I am here to introduce uh, a speaker about public education in Oakland, Mr. Mike Hutchinson. He is with the Oakland Public Education Network. Oakland, uh, Mike was born and educated in Oakland, attended Oakland Public Schools, and he's currently running for the Oakland School Board. Um, he's a strong advocate. He's a strong advocate for community control of school, community involvement in the schools, and people from Oakland, parents and families and community members working for the schools that our kids deserve. So let me turn it over to Mr. Mike Hutchinson. Check, check. Okay, great. So my name is Mike Hutchinson. I'm a very proud graduate of Oakland Public Schools. Um, in Oakland, actually, my mom was a kindergarten teacher for over 40 years in Oakland Public Schools. And my father was actually an instructor here at Laney for about 20 years in the TV and media department. And so public education is in my blood, especially here in Oakland. Um, a lot of people don't realize that public education has been under attack. And in Oakland, the attack really started in 2003 when the state came in and took over um, Oakland Unified School District. And when the state came in and took over our public school system, what they did is they took total control. Our democratically elected school board no longer had any authority. And the state appointed a state administrator who had full authority over our whole city schools. And so what that state administrator started to do when he got here is he started to close our traditional public schools. And he started to replace them with privatized charter schools. And hopefully some people have heard about charter schools. Hopefully not many people go to them. But hopefully people have heard about it. And what a charter school is, it is a privately managed school that uses public dollars. So our public tax dollars still go to fund these charter schools, but our school board is not in control of them. They have their own private board. And in Oakland, because we were taken over by the state, we have the highest rate of charter schools in the state of California. And so we are in the worst situation in the whole state, where about 30% of our schools have been privatized and turned into charter schools. Fortunately, we regained local control in 2009. So the state was in control for six or seven years. But as we regained local control, and, we, and our school board regained their authority, then we started to have another problem. And that problem was the influence of outside money from billionaires. And what has been happening in Oakland for 10 years is billionaires who live outside of Oakland have used their money to win school board races for their candidates. So I've run for school board twice before in 2012 and 2016. And in those two races, I had half a million dollars spent against me. Mm. Whereas my campaign had about $20,000. Mm. And these billionaires are across the country. So actually, Michael Bloomberg, who's now running for president, yes. Yes. spent hundreds of thousands of dollars in Oakland for school board races. He spent money directly against me. And so we started to look at it and we started to wonder what was going on. Why are all these billionaires so interested in school board elections in Oakland? And then for me, a big thing happened. In 2012, I've worked in schools for about 20 years. Um, in 2012, two of the schools that I worked at for a decade, Maxwell Park Elementary and Santa Fe Elementary, were two of the five schools closed by our school board. And when they closed my schools, um, I kind of tripped out. 
And, and since then, we have been working by any means necessary to stop the madness in our schools and to really regain local control. In 2012, we organized. We tried to fight those closures. Uh, we had protests in the street, everything we could think of. But we were not successful in saving those five schools. But what came out of it was a movement for public education here in Oakland. And what we've done is we've actually um, partnered with cities and organizations from across the country that are going through the same thing. We are a part of the Journey for Justice National Alliance, which is a national alliance of black and brown-led grassroots organizations from across the country fighting for educational justice. And so with this national alliance, we have members in Chicago, Detroit, New Orleans, New York, across the country, because all of these other cities are facing the same things that we're facing here in Oakland. And there's a national pattern where cities, especially cities with large black and brown populations, have been under attack by these outside dollars coming in. Because they don't want us to control our own school systems. They don't want us to be able to educate our own youth. They don't want us to be able to empower ourselves. So thankfully, we've been turning the tide. We've actually had a series of victories over the last couple of years. And our National Alliance, uh, if you go on the website and you look at Bernie Sanders' website or you look at Elizabeth Warren's website, they have very strong education platforms and ideas for how to move public education forward. A lot of that is because my National Alliance has been in consultation with those campaigns. And, and what, what, a, what a lot of it has been is we have grown strong enough, whereas eight years ago we were begging them to listen to us, now they come and ask us for our advice. And so we are quickly trying to turn the tide. But here in Oakland, um, things are at an emergency point. And although we've had a series of victories, we are still really up against it, especially here in Oakland. And so a lot of these forces, uh, the billionaire dollars, they're really trying to privatize our schools, and it's really about money. When we say privatize, what it really means is they want to profit off of our education system. And so what we are trying to do here in Oakland is counter their narrative and really build a movement to take back control. You will hear the privatizers come in and they talk about choice, that every family should have a choice for what school they go to. And so what they do is they close our public schools, they open up a charter school in its place and say, now you have a choice to go there. We have a different message. We say that if we want to authentically give our families a choice, then we need to have a quality public school in every neighborhood. Here, 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 here. We know that most families, if things were equal, we know that most families would choose to walk to their neighborhood school. We know that families don't want to have to choose to go up to the hills to get a quality education or to send their babies on a bus across the city. And so instead of putting money into closing schools and privatizing and losing money because other people are profiting off of it, we should be putting those dollars in our traditional public schools that we know have never had enough resources, that we know have never served the community well enough. And so the solution is not to close our schools, but to make them into quality schools. And so if you watch on the news, you'll see the mismanagement of Oakland Public Schools regularly. Uh, our school board now in Oakland claims that there is a budget deficit, but it's not true. Our school board in Oakland for the last four years has been cutting spending at our schools, but they don't have to. So just a couple of facts. Last year, OUSD, our public school district, ended the year with a $21 million surplus. The year before, they ended the year with a $29 million surplus. So when the school year ended for 2018-19, OUSD, Oakland Unified School District, had over 71 million sitting in the bank account left over. And instead of using that money to restore the cuts to our schools, or maybe even improve things, they keep that money in, in their bank accounts and they say they need to cut even more. 
And we're starting to see some major problems because of it. Hopefully everyone saw in the news what's been happening at McClyman's High for the last week. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it is criminal. It is criminal that McClyman's High right now is closed indefinitely. Mm. And the high school students have been sent to three different schools because their school is not safe. Because they found a chemical in the groundwater, in the soil, that they should have known has been there. And that's on top of the fact that we've had lead in the water at McClyman's for four years and they've done nothing about it. So besides the, the issues with receiving a quality education so our students can go on to success in their future, our school board has been so mismanaged that many of our schools are not even safe. And so thankfully, besides the fact that we've been working on uh, discovering the budget numbers and we know that there's money, we have a real chance this year to change what's been happening in Oakland. So as we talk about the national elections, they are really, really important. Um, but there's even more important elections coming up this year. And those are the elections that we have here locally in Oakland. This year in November in the elections, we have a city council that has eight seats on our city council. Five of the eight seats are up for election this year. A majority of the city council. And four of the seven school board members seats are up for election. So this year in November, we will be electing a majority of our uh, city leaders, of our city's politicians, of the people who will be in charge. That is where hopefully we really need to get involved. It's important that we vote, but I know the presidential elections seem real distant and far off, and it feels like it's hard to influence it. But we can all have a really big influence in our local elections. I'm going to be running for school board in District 5. Um, in, a, in another month or two, I will be back down here asking for people to come and get involved in our campaign. Uh, Oakland is districted, so we have seven districts in Oakland. Right now, we are in District 2, I'm pretty sure. But I live in District 5, which is basically Glenview, Fruitvale, all the way down to the bottoms. And so I encourage everyone to find out what district you live in if you live in Oakland. I encourage you then to see who's running for election locally that will be representing you either at City Hall or on the school board. We have a really good chance this year of winning these elections, especially for the school board because we've made it not fun for the people who are there now, for the incumbents. So they are not running for re-election. So we have open seats. And, and lastly, because my time is almost up, I want to encourage everyone in here not just to vote, and really not just to get involved with a campaign of, of maybe somebody you believe in, but to actually look into running for office yourself. Eight years ago, Eight years ago, I was Coach Mike on the playground working with the kids. I didn't want to have to run for school board. It wasn't even on my radar. But when I looked around, nobody was doing anything. And nobody of quality was running. And my thing is, if I can't trust anyone else to do it, I'm going to do it myself. And what we need is we need more real folks from here who are really a part of the community to take a stand and take a chance at running for office. Because if we're not going to represent ourselves, we're really going to be at a loss. And what I always kept in my mind, my goal for eight years, has been to kick in the doors so I can bring my folks in the room with me. And so hopefully some of you will, will pick up that momentum. And please, get involved. Because if we don't get involved, we're just going to be at the mercy and we'll just have to accept what they do to us instead of being able to build what we can do for ourselves. Thanks. Mm -hmm.